Hi, everyone. And I also want to introduce my co-founder, who's over here, Pornima Vijay Shankar, has uh, come along today, too. And she's the founder of uh, Femgineer. She brought me on um, a couple of months ago to be her co-founder, and I'm thrilled to be here. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about street cred. And I started exploring this topic of street cred as I worked with women, primarily, um, who were really bright technologists, but had taken a break in their career probably to raise kids. Like they'd spent a few years at home having young children, and then they wanted to get back into the workforce. And as they thought about getting back into that workforce, they realized they had this gap on their resume. They weren't really sure what to do about that. They wanted to fill it with things they felt they needed to prove their credibility, even though they had incredible experience before that. Um, I also started hearing from people through um, Femgineer's mentoring programs that there are people who um, are pivoting their careers. Um, perhaps they had been a technical recruiter or headhunter or something like that, and they were picking up programming skills and they wanted to become a software engineer. Again, they were searching for that credibility. Um, and then there are people who um, perhaps had been database engineers or network security engineers and wanted to move into mobile app development. They had tons of experience, but they felt they needed to build up the credibility um, to go after the jobs to prove that they could do the job. And this term street cred, I know many of you are from outside the United States, but um, hopefully it means something. But if it doesn't, street cred really comes from American um, inner cities, from disadvantaged youth who really need to survive on the street. And um, they had to build up a reputation. And I'm going to stand bigger because they seem bigger, stronger, tougher than they really were. And, um, or maybe they were and they just still needed to build their reputation. And so this term street cred is kind of a fun way to look at what people can do, what businesses can do to make themselves seem bigger than life, larger than life, stronger, tougher, whatever it might be. Um, and if you're not sure you need street cred, we have, have a little, um, some data to share with you. Um, so who knows or would like to guess what the average age of a successful entrepreneur is in tech, like yeah, a growth industry, tech, aerospace. We got one back here first. Go ahead. 35. 35. Anyone else? What did you think? Uh, you said tech. That threw me off. I, I'm, well, it's growth industry. 40, 50. 40, 50, right. OK. 45. 45. So it's actually right in the average of what you said. It's 40. OK, that's the average age of a successful entrepreneur in these high growth um, fields. Now, how many of you are 40? I didn't think so. Um, how many of you are between the age of maybe 20 and 34? Almost everyone, a few, few maybe younger than that. So bad news again. For people between the age of 20 and 34, um, compare yourself to someone who's 55. 55-year-old entrepreneur is twice, <laughs> twice as successful, or the chances are it's that he or she will be twice as, as successful as you are if you're between 20 and 34. Go ahead. Was there a definition of successful? There was in what I read. Um, this was from uh, Whitney Johnson's blog post about a week or two ago on Harvard Business Review. And she points to more research if you want to know what that is. But um, I thought it would be helpful to just get your attention just saying successful. You know, let's, you can imagine what you might want to fill in the blank with that um, in terms of uh, running companies or turning over profit or whatever it might be. Yeah. So as young entrepreneurs, you may need the street cred, right? You may need to build yourself up, have a bigger reputation than these 55-year-olds that are going to be twice as successful might be. Um, and that's what street cred's all about. Um, and I'm going to start off talking about business street cred. And I have five examples to show you of how businesses can build up their street cred. Um, first is McDonald's, which I have to laugh at because I'm really not a customer of McDonald's. But years and years ago, decades ago, McDonald's would have signage outside of its restaurants saying how many billions or millions of burgers served. And the photo on the left is back when hamburgers were just 15 cents. They served a million burgers, and they proudly claimed and shared that simple metric of how many burgers they served, right? Um, years and years later, they started claiming 99 billion served, OK? Now, what does this simple metric do? It's, it's telling customers simply a number. This is how many we've served. But what it's doing is providing something that the customer then molds into an impression of this company. Now, if you were um, traveling by that McDonald's um, sign when bur burgers were 15 cents, you might say to yourself, huh, a million people have eaten these burgers already. Maybe I'll like one, too. McDonald's isn't telling you you're going to like them, 
right? You're filling in that blank. And so McDonald's built its street cred and its popularity through that simple metric. Example number two, Nordstrom's. So just last month, Nordstrom started um, tapping into the wisdom of the crowd that is on Pinterest and curating displays in their stores showing the top <coughs> pinned items on Pinterest. And on the left here, the color isn't great with um, the sunlight, but on the left is actually an in-store display of some shoes with set that and it says, the little tag says, this is the top, these are top pinned items on Pinterest. And they also have um, hang tags on m different pieces of merchandise with that Pinterest logo so that if a customer is browsing through racks or tables of merchandise, they might see that. And here, Nordstrom's is not saying, um, wow, you know, this, you know, having salespeople on the floor saying this is a great product, fashion forward or anything. They don't have to because they're tapping into the wisdom of crowds. They're providing street cred for their, their merchandise through the Pinterest crowd, okay? So number three, um, anybody know who this is? Tom, it's not, yeah. Tom Shoes, his name's actually Blake Mykoski, but yes, he created Tom Shoes. Um, and this is an example of building street cred through striking a chord, by striking a chord with customers. And Blake Mykoski um, needed street cred in a big way. He um, had no experience selling shoes, manufacturing shoes, importing merchandise to the United States. What he did, I think probably most people know the story, is he went to Argentina for a three-month vacation. And am I moving around too much for the videographers, by the way? Okay, good. He went to um, Argentina for three months to travel. And while there, he was inspired to create a business importing these very simple canvas, traditional Argentinian shoes to Los Angeles, where he lived. And he decided while he was there that he didn't want to just start another business. He wanted to do something philanthropic. So he decided to um, give a pair of shoes to a needy kid for every pair of shoes he sold. And that story, and I'm sure it took him a long time to get it so simple and so um, compelling, but that story really struck a chord with people that he then shared it with in LA and his intern shared it with. And they shared it with friends and it kind of went viral. And before he knew it, Vogue magazine picked up the story and ran with it. And other fashion magazines started featuring him. And then he had a, a contract with Nordstrom for more shoes than he even had in stock. Um, which I guess if you're a shoe manufacturer or a seller, getting a Nordstrom deal is a big, is a big accomplishment. Um, and it's all because he was able to strike a chord, have a very simple story that compelled people to buy his shoes because they felt good because a kid in need was gonna get a pair of shoes, right? So striking a chord's a great way to um, build your street cred. Um, and by the way, you might notice he has two different color shoes on. This is very strategic. Um, and he does this so that wherever he might be, someone, chances are someone's gonna ask him, why do you have two different shoes on, right? Because it's kind of weird. And he then can tell them the story, strike a chord with one more person, build up street cred with one more person who is then gonna go on and evangelize for him. Okay. Fourth example, street cred with win-win solutions. And I think the freemium model in software is a great example of win-win solutions. So I have three different ones here. Um, uh, Dropbox, which the freemium model is you get the first two gig of storage in the cloud for free, right? If you want more, you start paying. Uh, Words with friends. If you want to have a free Words with friends game, that's fine, it's available. But with every play, you get ads served to you, right? And if you want the free, if you don't want ads, then you can upgrade and buy the, the app itself. Um, and LinkedIn, which provides a lot of um, free, um, or a, a service to allow you to put your information for free into it. Um, and then, of course, if you want to have additional capabilities, it will start charging you, um, being able to send messages to people outside your network and things like that. So all of these are win-win, because as um, the, the business, it's a win for them to give things away for free because they get customers, right? They, they immediately, and we're talking about free customers. I, I caught the end of Dave's talk, not um, talking about customers you might have to pay $50 per customer for. These are free customers, and, um, and it's a win for the consumer because they get something that is of value to them for free, right? And of course, you grow your business from there. So you get that initial street cred, that credibility, by getting that um, so many um, hundreds of thousands of customers initially and start um, upselling them.
okay? And the last one is Draper University. So this is street cred by association, okay? And association, um, and I don't mean any to serve, to do any disservice to Draper University, but um, you know, frankly, this is not an accredited university, right? You've all come and spent your summer here, spent tuition money, and in many cases spent travel dollars to be here. Um, and there's really no guarantee of what you're gonna get from this, right? But you're here, I think, because of the association, the credibility that Draper University has simply by association with Tim Draper and his network across Silicon Valley. Is that a fair statement? Okay, yeah, yeah I thought so. Um, so that street cred by association is a big deal, okay? So I went through five ways that businesses can build up street cred. And in all of these, the important thing is they're not bragging about themselves per se. They're providing something, again, that can be molded by the, the consumer, by the customer, by um, the press into something that might be um, bigger and larger than life. Okay. So as I was talking, did anyone think of other businesses having street cred and other examples? Any ideas? Anyone want to share? No? Well, I guess when, when Facebook started, it had street cred because of the exclusivity. You couldn't get a Facebook Excellent. account unless you had like a, well, Harvard, and then later like you need, you had dot edu. So like, mm -hmm. like, you know, it's kind of things like, oh, anybody can have a MySpace account, but you got to be in a college, go to Facebook. Right, so that exclusivity was huge for them to build up the street cred. <coughs> um, you wanted to be in it, even if you didn't even know what it was, right, because it was so exclusive. Great. We'll give you next. Okay, Adam, go Demonstration ahead. when Toyota like had the space shuttle being towed by a Tundra. Mm -hmm. Kind of. Yep. So I guess that's association and demonstration. But I love that though, but by demonstration is another great way to um, prove that you um, can do the job even though you're not sharing anything else about you. You're just showing it, right? Yep. Right here. Yeah, just all celebrity endorsements. So celebrity endorsements. Yep. I like Honest Company by Jessica Alba. What's that? Honda what? Honest. Honest company? Did you like ecological and eco Okay, I'm not familiar with them. Uh, eco products. Eco products, okay. Yep, celebrity endorsements. One more. Uber. Uber. Just the fact that they made a reliable, easy way to get a nice car. Mm-hmm. Yep. I heard a funny story about Uber. Um, someone tweeted this recently that um, they were getting an Uber ride from the airport and the Uber driver, who they didn't know, came out and hugged them and said, I love you, it's so good to see you. And the guy's like, what are you doing? And he's like, well, I'm not supposed to be, as a taxi service, I'm not supposed to be in this passenger pickup and drop off lane, so I had to pretend I knew you. <laughs> okay, isn't that cute? Okay, one more. Uh, any product that Apple comes out with? Any product that Apple, how do, how do the, those products get their street cred? Just from their previous successes. Previous successes, yep, perfect. So by it being as associated with Apple, they get that immediate cred. You want to go try it out. You think it's going to be good. You have a certain perception. Um, yep. Another one back here? Oh, Chris. Yes, well, we as young entrepreneurs can build our street cred through simply, for example, you are talking to us here. Why not share what you are saying to us via Twitter? And by that, we get more followers because we share our experience. Yep. In fact, the next part of my talk, I'm going to get into individual street cred. So that's a great segue. Um, do you want to have one more? Or, okay, one last one. You're the last one. Um, I don't know if you've heard of them, but Uniglo, the retail giant. My, like my son's favorite store. <laughs> I have a teenage son, and that's the only place he wants uh, to they shop. Definitely, they definitely strike a chord just because they have like really cute things to wear, but it's affordable. Um, yes. And they also started doing the wearable technology um, in their uh -huh. clothing as far as like insulated heating in like your jack their jackets yeah. and stuff. And then also they were the first brand, I think, in New York to advertise like on the turns files that people walk through every day to get on the train. So they, they put like, you know, marketing mm -hmm. materials. Like, okay. So some innovative marketing. Yeah. Um, Japanese connection, like um, if we haven't had a lot of Japanese fashion forward stuff, mm -hmm. and so it seemed like, oh, this is going to be a little unique and catch our attention, and then it's affordable and fashion forward when you go in the stores, yeah. And then the wearable tech, I think, is great. Okay, one last one. Uh, H&M partnering with very famous designers. Yes, okay, H&M buying very, or hiring very famous designers gives them the association, right? Yep, excellent. So. So businesses have so many ways to leverage and build street cred and make them seem, especially when they're nascent, seem larger than life. If they're more established, they can still grow with that street cred as well. Great. Okay, so let's move on to personal street cred. And um, I'm gonna go through all of these approaches of building street cred for individuals. Um, and as I go through that, um, and I must admit I started blending it, 
entrepreneurs um, are individuals, but they are, their brand, their personal brand is intimately tied with the business that they're starting, their product. And so you're gonna see some examples of how individuals who are entrepreneurs um, have built up their street cred, but a lot of it's based on the products they're delivering too. So it, it does kind of blend. Um, and I'm gonna start off by, um, sorry, I'm glad Tim Draper left because, anyway. Um, some people have so much street cred, they don't even have to tell you about it. They don't have to brag about it at all. And this is Tim Draper's first page of his LinkedIn profile, and he really doesn't have anything else up there. He has his, his um, founding and managing director of J Draper Fisher Jurvetson and his education, and that's kind of it. Um, it's simple, it's elegant, it's minimalist, and he doesn't need to do anything else, right? It's beautiful. And I'm kind of fascinated by LinkedIn profiles. Um, people who are very senior and accomplished often have this very minimalist approach. Um, so you might start seeing it and checking, you know, noticing it as well. Um, and I was here about two weeks ago when Steve Jurvetson spoke. I was sitting over in the corner um, just participating and listening. And Steve Jurvetson's LinkedIn <laughs> profile is a little bit different. Equally accomplished, right? Tons of street cred, but boy, he tells you about it. And I don't mean to say anything bad about Steve. This is just his style. So I know it's sort of hard to see, but this is, these are like the first three screens of his LinkedIn profile, where he talks about every single board he's on or has ever been on. He talks about his um, position here at Draper Fisher Jurvetson. He talks about his, edu his um, work experience all the way back to his first engineering job at HP, which was a long time ago. Um, anyway, honors and awards, and it goes on from your organizations, his education, everything. Very accomplished, tons of street cred, but he feels the need to share it here. Okay. Um, and if you go down another level, like in Silicon Valley, you know, hierarchy, I guess, you get to people who have been like VPs at software companies. And our LinkedIn profiles have other metrics that we're sharing. It's not the boards we're on and all of that, but it's things that... Um, give us bragging rights. It's things like how large a budget have we overseen? How many people have we supervised? Um, how much, what kind of innovation have we led and how much revenue did that deliver to our companies? Um, if we're into efficiency, how much did we save our company by putting in different efficiency practices? You see, so those simple metrics are the things that VPs and other um, engineering executives might be sharing on their LinkedIn profiles. Um, and there's no right or wrong here about what simple metrics are for you. You just have to figure out what makes sense for your audience. Your audience being investors, partners, potential employees, customers, and so forth. And so some other examples of simple metrics um, might be the number of Twitter followers. And here's Guy Kawasaki, you know, supposedly the first evangelist in Silicon Valley. Um, he has 1.3 million Twitter followers. That's impressive. Great street cred. Um, if you have a clout score, if you track that, if you're very active in social media, that might be another simple metric that you can provide and other people build their impression of you based on that. Um, if you have a blog, you might list how many followers you have, right? Um, if you are involved with um, online advertising, it may be a campaign that you ran and came up with that um, increased your, the click-through rate on something dramatically. Um, if you're an engineer, Maybe it's how many open source contributions you've made, how many lines of code are in source code repos, or how many times your projects have been downloaded. Okay? It doesn't matter what these numbers are. Everyone's got simple metrics that they can share. But just think about your target audience and what's going to resonate with them and help be the equivalent of a million hamburgers served for you. Okay, second example, street cred through the wisdom of crowds. Has anyone recognized the top left, that colorful picture? What is it? Um, it's a toy uh, spe especially made for girls to encourage them to pursue engineering or like, you know, it's like the first toy towards, um, towards that, yes. Cold yeah. Kickstarter. It, yes, yes, exactly. So it's, it's Goldie Blocks is the toy's name. And Deborah Sterling is the founder of this company that created this. She had a vision for it and she did a Kickstarter campaign. <coughs> and the Kickstarter cam campaign was um, she wanted to raise $150,000 to um, manufacture her product and do the first run. And within a month, she... Uh, um, raised almost twice as much of that, 280000 I think it was. So she then said, okay, the crowd's speaking. This is a valuable product. They're, they're funding me. They're, you know, they're voting with their money, so to speak. And she's turned that into a great press opportunity to show how um, popular this toy is going to be. And she just got a deal with Toys R Us. Again, another amazing um, accomplishment. Um, 
Another example of the wisdom through crowds is the Netflix culture presentation. So Reed Hastings, do you guys know about this presentation? No, no, some people do, okay. Reed Hastings um, uh, created this PowerPoint, I don't know, I think it was four or five years ago, to talk about the culture at Netflix. And the culture, what he shared, um, some of it was sort of you'd expect, some of it was pretty innovative even for Silicon Valley. And one of um, the things that I thought was very innovative at the time was there was no vacation policy. Now most companies in the Valley at that point had, you get two weeks off or three weeks off to go on vacation every year and it's tracked and you have to get management approval and all of that. But at Netflix, they did away with that and just said, take the time you need, work it out with your manager. We trust that you're not gonna abuse the system, okay? Pretty innovative and a lot of companies have followed suit with that since then. Um, now what's interesting, he put this up on SlideShare and the wisdom of crowds. Any guesses on how many times it's been downloaded? And if you're online right now, it doesn't count if you're looking it up. No. Any guesses? A million? Two million? 150 million. 150. 4.6 million. So <laughs> we'll hide there. But 4.6 million have t downloaded or viewed the slide deck of 122 slides. Pretty impressive. So not only did he get the word out that Netflix had a very progressive culture, an innovative culture for employees, and probably attracted um, people to his company as a result, he became and developed street cred around being an innovative leader in Silicon Valley. And he was asked to speak on this, and he's built up his reputation as a result. Um, the third example, the Dropbox demo. Is that something people know about? Not necessarily. OK, a few, few people in the back, thanks. Um, do you want to explain it? Or, I mean, I'm happy to, but no, it, was a long time ago. it was a long time ago. That's cool. So Dropbox, um, back in 2008, the founder of Dropbox, um, Drew Houston, was having trouble convincing people of why they would want to put files into the cloud to share files that way, like having a central repository. People, you know, had their memory sticks and they were happy doing sneaker net or emailing files. Why do I need to, why do I need this thing called Dropbox? So he created a very simple demo to explain the power of Dropbox. Um, and he happened to include some inside jokes so family members and friends and employees would, would pick it up and share it. Um, and this led to him getting customers and it led to him um, getting the funding he needed. C incredibly powerful, so that's cool. And here is the YouTube statistics, 250,000 views. I guess it's a little viral, not that much. But what happened is he, because of this demo, has become a thought leader on minimal viable products. And he's written up in the um, Lean Startup book by Eric Rice. Um, that's where I first heard about it. Some of you are shaking your head now. All of a sudden, be just because he was desperate to build up his credibility for his product and his company, and he created this demo, he's now an expert and thought leader on lean product development and this notion of the minimal viable product and how you can convince people your product, your MVP, is worthwhile. Um, but more <laughs> what kills me is look at the growth curve. 2008 when he launched it to today. It continues to grow in popularity. This is like a five-year-old demo. The technology's probably changed since then, but it's still growing because of the street cred um, that he's gotten in, he's written up in the book and so forth. Okay, so this wisdom of crowds. Um, so what's interesting to me about this is once you have the crowd speaking on your behalf, you have to kind of do some PR and marketing around that. You have to blog about it. You have to do whatever. Because people aren't naturally just going to see how many SlideShare um, views has something's got, your, your presentation has, or how many um, hits your, your YouTube video has gotten. So you have to think about doing a little promotion on that front to build the cred. OK, this one I'm a little embarrassed about, the rocket ship. Bear with me. There's a reason there's a rocket ship on here. So just like Blake Mykoski, developed street cred with his story, okay? Um, that story came because he took a diversion on his career path. He, he was running a cable, uh, like a reality TV network, and he decided to take the three months off to travel. That travel gave him rocket fuel um, for thinking about his new business. And I believe that any diversions you take on your normal career path, whether that is um, traveling internationally or being assigned to another office for your company for a while, going back to school, um, having a gap year, um, even doing a different job for a while, maybe you're a product manager, product marketing, and you're gonna go spend six months in sales. All of these allow you to have diversions which, are, which get you out of your comfort zone and give you rocket fuel that will 
and I swear it will, it will turn into a story that you can then use to strike a chord with your potential customers. Um, and maybe your diversion, your rocket fuel is being here this summer, and that's great. Um, but look for the opportunity to have a story that's as compelling as Tom's that you can strike a chord with and build your street cred as a result. Okay, next one, win-win solutions. So just like that freemium model in software, um, what can individuals do to create win-win solutions? Um, have people seen the internship, the movie? Yeah, is it any good? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I haven't seen it yet, all right. So um, I just chose that as an image for an internship and um, you're never too old to go for an internship. And if you wanna get, build skills and build your cred in an area that you're not um, experienced in, an internship's a great way to do that, right? Um, if you don't have experience with a certain customer target, like maybe you've got experience building um, and selling to consumers, but you wanna learn about the enterprise, um, an internship's a great way to do that. Um, and of course, there are other skill development things that you can learn along the way. Um, and it's win-win, maybe I'm stating the obvious, win-win because you get this free experience and the, the employer gets very inexpensive or free talent. Um, the next one, the guy picking up trash on the beach is um, for volunteering, right? Volunteering is another win-win solution. Again, if you have specific skills you want to learn, finding an, uh, a volunteer experience that will give that to you is great. Um, and people I know who are on boards of, for, um, nonprofits, all of them say, oh, it's great, you know, yeah, you learn things and you feel good about being on the board, but the most important thing they get from that is meeting other people that eventually will be important to them professionally. Um, so it's um, another great reason for getting involved with a philanthropic effort. The third area um, that I think is a win-win solution is guest blogging. And I was talking to Kristen before um, we, I got started and she mentioned what she's blogging on these days. And um, you need to be a thought leader to build up your street credibility, right? And it doesn't matter what that is in, as long as you're passionate and knowledgeable about it and you start blogging. If you don't wanna blog, start commenting on other people's blog posts or on um, Harvard Business Review articles or whatever that might be. Get your name associated with that topic and say some good stuff about it. Um, or guest blog. Guest blogging is so win-win because you get to have be seen as a thought leader. You get to share your perspective with somebody else's audience that they've already curated and pulled together. Um, and it's win-win for the blog host, the blog author, because they're off the hook for you know, one day or one week from having to write. And believe me, it's, Purnima and I both blog a lot. And it's, it, can be, it can be pretty um, daunting at times to just keep up with your, um, your posting schedule. So these are all ways that you can um, build up your cred in a win-win kind of way. And then by association. Um, so just like um, Draper University has its cred from association, association with Tim Draper, what's your equivalent um, for your business, your personal life? Um, first picture is for angel investor. Those angel investors, if you're going to go after angel investors, are going to be so critical. You know, it's nice to get money from mom, dad, Uncle Joe, whatever, but the more credibility your angel investors have with the rest of the VC community, with the partners that you might need to have for your business, with potential customers, that's really, they're not just giving you money, they're opening up a whole lot of um, other things for you and giving you street cred by association simply with your angel investors. And if you're gonna go for a series A round, the caliber of your angel investors is critical, okay? So you can talk to your mentors about ideas for what that might be if you are gonna be looking for a, um, angel funding, but huge opportunity to build your street cred. Another is publishing a book, okay? You get street cred when you publish a book because all of a sudden you're elevated to have the same reputation as all the hundreds of thousands of other people have written books, right? Um, and while you have to have the content, you have to know what you're gonna write about, you have to have the time to actually write the book. It's so easy to publish books these days with self-publishing, electronic distribution, print on demand, and so forth. So if you've got that um, idea for a book, spend the time because that will give you street cred. Um, if you're lucky enough to be invited to give a TED Talk, street cred goes through the roof, right? Because you are associated with all the other amazing TED Talks. There's some smiles. Is someone here giving a TED Talk? Awesome. <laughs> the person who introduced me. Thank you. Congratulations. So you've got great street cred and you just went up in my books. Yes. Um, so, yes. Um, but for mere mortals among us, the rest of us, um, your LinkedIn profile is huge. 
in terms of who you're associated with through that LinkedIn profile. And I'll share a story. The reason I'm even here today is, as you can see, I'm only I'm two levels away from Tim Draper. I don't know Tim, but I know Isaac Babs, and I used to work with him and be in soccer carpools together with him. Um, and he's a mentor here. I don't know if he's spoken, but he's probably some, uh, yeah, I mean, he's, he's, mentor. he's your mentor. Great, great, great guy. Um, I happened to notice on his LinkedIn profile, just looking at my network, that he was a mentor here. And I, so I said, can I buy you a cup of coffee? I'd love to hear about what's going on at Draper University. And he then introduced me to Carol Lowe. And you know, here I am today giving the talk. Um, so as you move forward in your careers, take time to really actively manage that network that you're doing, um, that you're growing on LinkedIn. Um, and maybe something is going to replace it in the future. But right now, LinkedIn's where it is at. And people are going to be looking you up as entrepreneurs, um, people being potential investors, customers, partners, employees, OK? Interns, um, whatever you need. So it's really important to have connections. And hopefully, there's going to be some association as people look you up with um, people in their network, OK? OK, so I'm going to wrap it up now. Um, and I want to have time for questions. But um, I want to let you know I am so excited for all of you as you are thinking about the businesses you want to start or maybe have already started. Um, I, I think some of you already have um, started businesses. It's an exciting time. And I don't want to, you know, reflecting back on those numbers I shared with you initially, I don't want you to feel at all daunted like you can't do this. You can. And I hope that these street cred techniques and approaches will help you build that larger than life um, personality, personal brand, brand for yourself and your company and your product that you'll be delivering. Um, and so if people have questions, uh, I'd love to hear them. And, or if you've been thinking as um, you've been hearing me talk about some action items you're going to start doing, what's your plan for building your street cred? If you want to share that, that would be great, too, because I'd love to hear that. But thank you very much. Thank you. Great talk. Uh, I guess one of, the, one of my plans is uh, striking a chord. Mm -hmm. um, you know, having that ability to uh, empower any parents to help out their kids simply by getting their local haircut or changing their oil in a local get, uh, car shop. Um, so how, because we're kind of in the pitching phase, mm -hmm. uh, and because we're so young and have little, very low street cred, mm -hmm. is there any good tactics of kind of, you know, um, not lying, but saying, I will have massive street cred? things that I'm doing? Um, you don't want to be, you can be aspirational, definitely. But you want to be um, realistic. And you know, think about that um, lower class urban youth saying, someday I'm going to do time in prison. That doesn't, that doesn't do it, right? Someday I'm going to shoot somebody. That doesn't, that doesn't give them any cred. So I'd be careful there. Um, think about what you're doing today or striking the chord with stories about the real pain points that busy parents have today. Um, maybe through some testimonials. Get some people into your conversation to speak um, firsthand about how crazy their lives, how busy their lives, how much better their lives would be with, with your solution. Does that make sense? Yeah. No. Go ahead. All right, I have two questions. First, uh, how do you translate individual street cred into company street mm -hmm. cred? So like you talked a little bit about like, you know, if you have that individual street cred, which I'm not saying, like, how do you, like, you yep. talk a little bit about getting individual street cred. How would you go about translating that yep. once you get that? As an entrepreneur, I don't think you even have to do anything to translate it. it you are intimately tied with your brand that is your company and your product. Um, and that's good news and bad news. I mean, it's easy to do because it's, I, I do think it's seamless. The bad news is you can't have any bad street cred, any bad reputations, because that is also going to taint your company's um, potential reputation. So, um, so as you go forward and look, look for things to leverage and, and build your street cred, it doesn't matter if it's the product you or um, the general space you're in and so forth. It's all, all seamless. OK. And the second mm -hmm. question is actually about LinkedIn. Like, is it like, do you still suggest it for like, people who are in the beginning stages of oh, entrepreneurship? Yeah. Because like, I mean, I can almost see that. Like, he's spending all this, like, well, I guess just usage of it. Like, he's spending all this time on LinkedIn when he should be, or she, he or she, mm -hmm. when he should be building his company and working harder. Yep. So, um, so I have a 17-year-old daughter who had her first internship this summer. She's a marketing intern um, here in the Valley. And the night before she started her internship, she's 17 years old, I said, you have to create your LinkedIn profile tonight. And you have to start connecting with absolutely everyone you meet during your internship. Um, 
she hasn't even gone, you know, she'll go to four-year college, you know, she'll do all of that before she even will start leveraging this network, but you have to start it right away, in my mind. Um, and does it take away from other activities? Well, how much time are we talking about here? You know, adding, like, if anyone wants to add me to your LinkedIn network after this and spend, you know, 30 seconds doing that, please do. I would be glad to connect with you. Just make sure you say something like, great talk today at Draper, nice seeing you today at Draper, something so I know, you're, you know, how we met. Um, but it takes so little time to wrap up at the end of the day, spend a couple of minutes connecting with the people you met. That's all it takes, okay, to build up those connections. Um, and then you can grow from there and use it more as a platform for creating your thought leadership pieces, you know, if you want to start posting updates and things like that. But simply um, spending just a few minutes a day building up the networking associate, aspect. the networking aspect, okay. I think is huge. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Because then people are going to check you out. Right? And who do you know that I know? It's huge. Okay. Let's go ahead. Um, I have a question about LinkedIn. I've seen it both ways where some people have tons and tons of connections mm -hmm. and they think there's value in numbers. And then I've seen some people who have only a few, but those few people they have are all rock stars. Mm -hmm. Which one is mm -hmm. better? Yeah, so um, very good question. And I must admit, I only connect with people that I've actually met. And I do get a lot of invitations to connect from people. I, I have no idea who they are. Um, I met a woman um, a month or two ago who said she has over 3,000 people in her network. I'm like, do you, do you remember how you, she, and she's just got one of those minds. I remember every single place I met these people, something about them, I remember them. And this is her Rolodex. She's just one of those people who'd always have a big Rolodex, you know, physically, um, and it's just translated into her online, her online um, version of that. Um, so, but I, I recommend being judicious. Connect with people you know, um, and don't go for volume. Um, so quantity over qual qual quality over quantity. But boy, I'd be suspicious of anyone who only had 10, 15, 20 connections. I mean, what kind of world are they living in today, right? How are they going to be successful if that's all they really have in their network, right? Gotcha. Yeah. Anyone, else, anyone else want to share action items you maybe jotted down or? have men took mental notes on of things you want to do to build your street cred? No? Okay. I started a blog. How to get it out there? Like yeah. How to reach readers and... Yep. Yep. So how many people have their own blogs here? A few. Any, any, any suggestions? Tips for, for um, building a blog and getting it out there and doing the readership? Guest blog. You Guess already blog. mentioned it. Mm -hmm. But you're lifting on other people's popularity. Yep. Yep. Um, so look for ways to, sh to start writing your blog, but then guest blog other places. And it not only um, drives traffic to your site because you become, you know, someone might be curious about you. It's great for search engine optimization juice, too. You have to have people linking into you, right? So another, another suggestion, please. Um, also, you want to share other people's content because whenever, you, like, if you use social media, if you use Twitter, um, if you share someone else's content, they will immediately go straight to your page. Mm -hmm. And so if your blog is like in your bio, then they automatically click it. And that's a good way to drive traffic. Yep. By not promoting yourself, but promoting somebody else. Yep. Good. Any suggestions? Pornima, do you have any suggestions based on your, yeah, you've been blogging for six or seven years now. Yeah, when I first started back in 2006, I really just told my network about it. And back then, my network was the startup that I was at, which was Mint.com. And LinkedIn hadn't even really yeah. taken off at that point, and neither had Twitter. And Facebook, at the time, had a way to import notes. So I could connect my WordPress blog to Facebook. They've since done away with it. So it was really just a combination of my very small startup network plus uh, some Facebook. And I am now quite surprised when I meet people in the Valley or at conferences when I say if engineer and they say, oh, I've heard of it. And not just like, oh, yeah, I've heard of it. They're like, oh, yeah, I've read it or mm -hmm. I've, I've read about one of your early posts or something funny that I had mentioned. So I know that they're actually reading it. Since then, though, um, you know, we made a more concerted effort. So mm -hmm. we do share our posts everywhere. We share them on LinkedIn, we share them on Twitter, we share them on Facebook. We do uh, Discus, Reddit, um, and it also depends on the type of post. So if it's something we think is going to be mass appeal, then we will share it everywhere. If we think it's only going to appeal to a small section, maybe only startup entrepreneur, maybe only women, then we'll share it in those channels that resonate. So it's not that we're doing a shotgun approach every time. Um, but the key thing is, is to be consistent and not just 
expect people will show up. A lot of times they will. I'm always surprised at the number mm -hmm. of people who just search and find us. But you really do want to share it across a few different networks when you're building up your base. And I'd add to that or summarize that um, people like to consume content in different ways, right? So as a blog author, you have to go to where they want to be, not assume they're going to come to you. So you have to be doing it through all the social media channels that you think your audience is going to be using. It doesn't take that much time, you know, st setting up a Facebook page, linking it to Twitter, you know, um, however you want to be getting it out. Go ahead. Um, I'm using link, uh, in messages on LinkedIn a lot mm -hmm. to track down new client leads. Excellent. Because, uh, it's a great way, it's a great tool for yep. the premium LinkedIn. It's a fantastic tool for mm -hmm. the filtration systems. And uh, I find myself sending a lot of cold emails, which mm -hmm. is quite an art from what I'm reading and I've been <laughs> studying quite a bit for about the past two years now. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask if you had any suggestions on uh, composing a LinkedIn cold email, because it's a little different than a cold email to your email address. It's almost more personal because you're going through the social network and mm -hmm. hopefully you would have a you know, third connection, or a third party or second. You know, there were, I was just reading a blog post today. Um, and well, anyway, and so it, it, but it had techniques like exactly how to word your um, your titles of your messages and do A/B testing on things to see which is working for you. But did you want to say something? I'm sorry. Yeah, I have oh, an example. So um, I don't know if any of you know this person. I actually didn't, but I picked up this book called the Steve Jobs Way when I was uh, touring in India earlier this year, and the author is Jay Elliott. And I had read in his bio that he still lived in Los Gatos, which is not too far from here. And so I just actually sent him a LinkedIn send mail. It's, it's on the premium service. Um, but I sent him a paragraph email just saying, I just read your book, it was really great. Here are maybe one or two takeaways. And I know you're probably really busy, but would love to drive down to Los Gatos and buy you a cup of coffee. Because this was the guy who had worked as the right-hand man for Steve Jobs. And since I'm never going to get a chance to meet Steve Jobs, I figured I might as well meet him. Um, and within a day, he responded and was up for grabbing coffee. So you'll be surprised. The key is you gotta, you got to do it. And sometimes you have to do it a couple times, especially in the case of cold emails. A lot of times people won't respond because they're on vacation, or you might have to try a different avenue than just LinkedIn. Um, but keep it short, get to the point, and obviously do a little ego boost of what yeah. it is like that, that you found appealing about them. Yeah. Not, oh, not too much flattery, like, oh, you're the greatest person on earth, but just like, yeah, just read your book, thought it was great, here's what I learned from it. Yeah, and notice it's, I just read your book. It's not, I'm going to read your book someday. Like, right, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's huge, yeah. right? And, oh, okay, we'll finish up, and then you're next. Go ahead. Okay. Um, one last point is that right now I'm actually trying to get in touch with a blogger who could be a potential person to review one of my products. Mm -hmm. And um, since we're talking about blogs, we're kind of yeah. like that. You know, having read, I could ask, potentially ask a question about something he wrote in his blog yeah. as a personal connector to kind of yeah. like show interest in him. Yes. Also, a, a deeper follow him on Twitter before yeah. you reach out. F like his Facebook page. You know, find him online and, and do whatever you can to show that you are interested in him as well. Right. I'm suited him. Go ahead. What's, what's your um, suggestion? I, I was going to say, I can feel like it's kind of intrusive with LinkedIn because it's more of a personal private network compared to Facebook and other sites. And, okay, I use it like you do too, but the whole entire thing is when you go to add someone and it says like, you know, are you like a colleague or you right. work with them yeah. or your friend? Yeah. Yeah. And it says, if you don't know them, we do not recommend you to add them. Mm -hmm. So I feel like now it's becoming on a different level where it's more acceptable. But like a year ago, it was more on so Interesting, level. interesting. For people to be trying to connect with you. Who you yeah, know it, it tells you a little message yeah. pops. You have to push like, okay. Like, yep. yep, you have to consciously do it. I don't know. Um, it, it, good point. I, who knows what the future is going to bring. Um, I hope it continues to be a really valuable tool um, for showing your network, connecting with people, not having to keep business cards around and so forth. Um, I hope that. I have that hope for it because it's, it's so darn useful when it's working, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. There's also this um, like free email tester online where basically, you know how most like CEOs, their email addresses are usually the first name at the company. Yeah. Maybe it'll be different, but sometimes you can actually like put that email in the, like, the test email generator and it will show you whether or not it's about email. I can send that to you. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yep. Hmm. Very cool. 
All right. Well, I'll um, stay around a little bit longer, but I want to thank all of you for your time and attention today. Um, it was been, it's been great, and as I said, I'm excited for everything you're going forward to do. Thanks so much. Thank you.